Hey there, welcome to Stoked to Be Here. Uh, I'm your guest host for this episode of the podcast, Phil. Uh, and today I've got the great pleasure of talking to the back half of Stella Tandem, Laura Massey Pugh. Laura, welcome Hi. to your own podcast. <laughs> Hi, that was a little bit surreal to kind of hear my own intro paraphrase. But yeah, no, it's great. Thank you so much for, yeah, it wouldn't have been quite the same, me just talking to myself. So really appreciate it. Somewhat different experience, perhaps. Um, yeah, well, as I, um, I know I've said to you, I, I've enjoyed listening to uh, to the podcast episodes that you put out. Um, but I wanted to hear more about you and, and Stevie. So hopefully the listeners will. Uh, we'll we'll share that and uh, and find this interesting too yeah i hope so i think it's a great idea so yeah hopefully yeah it will be interesting good stuff um so yeah i'll start like you you always do with sort of what led you into cycling is that something that you've you know done since a kid or you know, were you sporty as a child what what led you got you into sort of the long distance cycling world um yeah so i i definitely was not sporty growing up um i was you know always last to be picked for the rounders team should we say and i i was not into you know getting a sweat up or anything like that but one thing i always always had them was ridden my bike not any great distance with any great ambition but from like little bike crowds around the block when i was very young um to the point when i was in the sixth form at school i um I can't even remember why now, but I decided to ride my bike to school. Um, it's only about five miles um, and there was quite a good off-road cycle route, but yeah, and but I stuck with it. I, I started riding cycling to school and, uh, you know, spring, summer, winter, and I was still riding my bike to school. And I had a friend that would come with me. She was a bit more dedicated initially, and then she kind of petered out. And then I became this kind of oddball that rode a bike. Um, and the same thing continued through uni as well um yeah and I studied in Edinburgh and yet again I, I never had a car um so if I wasn't relying on public transport I was cycling um to and from the campus at uni in all weathers yet again so snow sleet everything um so I think it was that's where it started and I, I kind of had more of a, a um interest in adventures and, and being outdoors and I was into kayaking mm -hmm. and hill climbing and and kind of you know having these adventures in the great outdoors more than I was the sporty more athletic side of cycling shall we say okay no it makes makes a lot of sense and and so then what what led you to where you are now then what got you into I guess competitive is maybe not the right word but doing like odd axes and those sort of longer distance organized yeah events. and the more kind of yeah it is more sport but, and it, it's funny because a, a lot of people would you know look at me and assume that it's all down to Stevie um and obviously he was a massive part of that but actually the ball had started rolling before I'd even met him um so um when I was kind of in my mid-20s should we say um I was still commuting on the bike a bit but by that point I'd got a dog so going bike rides wasn't so easy um and I think my general kind of fitness has been a bit, been on a bit of a downturn as it were it's just kind of that midlife slump I was heading towards fairly quickly um I didn't really have any interest in any sports apart from going you know, doing bits of walking um and then a friend got me into roller derby um which was very exciting and suddenly I was enjoying kind of getting fitter and learning new skills and being part of a team which is something I'd not really done since I was at school and for the first time ever I seemed to be enjoying it and this was all going great until it turned out that I was particularly overextending myself slightly um managed to fairly traumatically injure my knee um and that put me out of action with the roller derby for <laughs> forever it turned out but at that time um yeah I I suddenly had a very serious injury to my knee which needed surgery and that was a big point where I suddenly started to weigh up I was like I can't take my health for granted here you know I've I've kind of been resting my laurels I tried to do something I particularly potentially wasn't fit enough for I didn't have the you know the strength and the musculature to protect my knee um and I had a fantastic physio at the time that um after my surgery, kind of took one look at me and went, I'm going to rebuild you. <laughs> I kind of went, you're a little bit nuts. Um, but he was he was entirely right. And there was all sorts of things um, to do with my gait and my posture. I'd broken a leg when I was very little. So I had kind of a funny walk and he corrected that. And um, to do, you know, even with my core strength and basically I could barely stand on one leg. My balance was so bad at the time. Um, 
and he kind of rebuilt me. And so that started the path. So he got me on a cross trainer and exercise bike. And I started religiously doing that daily. And I started to get fitter and fitter, lose a bit of weight. And it really started to build up. And I found that really exciting at the time that I was making these improvements. Um, and then partway through, or, you know, kind of towards almost the end of that process, because I was already back on my bike by then, I met Stevie. And he told me about the wonderful mystical world of Ordax and that was it. I was hooked, absolutely hooked. <laughs> so it sounds like it came along at just the right time then, really, in that in that sense. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it was, yeah, just like this meeting of, of things. He met me at just the right time that I was completely open to kind of new ideas, new challenges. And then, you know, him talking to me about kind of training properly and fitness and nutrition. And, you know, before I just got on my bike and ridden. And I can remember his... Um, He's actually one of his friends that picked up all this bulk load of cheap kit from Aldi at the time. And he came back with a pair of Lycra shorts and I was absolutely horrified, absolutely horrified about wearing these, <laughs> these shorts. I was like, there's no way I'm getting in those. And now, of course, I, I wear them regularly because it's just the most practical thing. But yeah, it was it was a big shift for me of going this. I was a very scruffy kind of tomboyish um teenager to kind of turning into a, a, a you know a, a more kind of athletic more sporty person yeah excellent cool so what's the i guess over the last few years what's the what's the training been like building up for this this ride and i guess how would you separate sort of regular being a cyclist and enjoying that side of things from training is it do you make a distinction there you know, is yeah, there some so, rides training and some rides just for pleasure because you'd have done it anyway? Um, yeah, it's interesting because every ride's training. And yeah, I mean, you could say, well, when did you start training for this? The thing is, I've never stopped. Um, you could say I've been training for this my whole life. And there's so many other skills apart from the, the cycling, you know, so the, the endurance, the, you know, being able to push on when you feel tired, when you're at rock bottom and, you know, things like that hark back to my days of, you know, kind of doing longer distance walks and being in scouts and things. Um, and then with Stevie, yeah, definitely developing kind of the longer rides. So the first year I met him, we did um, a lot of, uh, it was the second year, but we did a lot of tandem work um, and built my confidence there. And then I wanted to get on solo and start doing my own rides. And we'd always, I think pretty much every year, there'd always be like a target or a certain ride or a certain challenge I wanted to commit to. Um, so I'd always be training towards that. Um, but training, at one point we went on a holiday to Crete and training consisted of him kind of throwing an inflatable ball at my head while I swam up and down the pool, which probably wasn't really training at all. But I think we've always got this notion of um kind of perpetuating the fitness so throughout the winter we make the effort to do winter rides for example um so even when it's dank and dark outside we um we tend or we try to do a riding home for christmas ride where we ride to my parents who live um a convenient distance of about 200 kilometers away so about 120 mm -hmm. miles um and that's a good one to keep your momentum ticking over winter if you can do that at christmas time you kind of think you're well set for the rest of the year um, but the only time I've ever trained and trained to a, a training plan, um, I kind of have for a couple of cycling events, you know, including this, I've kind of had a rough idea of what I want to be doing when. But the only time I've really done it and really stuck to it has actually been when I did some long distance running, um, I actually ran coast to coast. And then I did have, and that was interesting because I think, because that was so separate from Steve, because he doesn't do the running. Mm -hmm. And from um, other influences I'd had, I designed myself this little training plan. And it was like, how, you know, a long run, a short run, how many runs I do a week, how many miles I want to do a week, and doing a high intensity session. And yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't really have a quantifiable way of measuring the results of that. But that's been the only time that I've had such a set training plan. Apart from that, any training goes. Um, yeah. And it, it, yeah, I mean, at the moment, I do have a set idea of what rides I want to fit in. If they yeah. don't happen, it kind of gets accepted. Fair enough. Yeah, I've, I've always taken the approach that the, the best way to get fit is not to lose fitness in the first place. Just try and maintain a baseline, even if it's just occasional. Uh, it's a much better place to be than all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. And the incidentals as well. I mean, sometimes, you know, you can 
do what you think is an epic ride and you finish at a pub, you have a bit of dinner, a few drinks and then you ride up a massive hill afterwards and that's all all part and parcel. That's an extra, an extra <laughs> bonus, as it were. <laughs> Excellent. Um, good stuff. You distracted me with that. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, well, let's talk about the ride around Wales then. Because that's that's what you were alluding to there. Yeah, um, it was there. So yeah. <laughs> Laura and Stevie stayed with me on the last night of that rather epic trip. Um, how did you find that? Because that was you were looking to do. Uh, Stevie put it as race distance, but I guess it's your your sort of tour distance. You say it's the yeah. I'd call it expedition distance. Okay, yeah, maybe not race. Good, good phrase, not racing. Yeah. I'm surprised he used the term race actually. But yeah, um, yeah, it was really pleased with it. It was tough and. I think if it hadn't been tough, we'd have been questioning a lot of things, to be honest with you. But for me, we ticked so many boxes. And not we knew we could ride that distance. You know, we know we can ride 100, 110 miles a day. Mm -hmm. um, that's doable. We kind of knew we could do it over that terrain, even though we knew, knew it wouldn't be easy. So the, the um, elevation in Wales and actually what caught us out more than we knew that we were getting the elevation but was the probably the more congested parts and not necessarily the roads although we did have some busy roads but some of the more busy cycle paths where we we're dodging dogs and push chairs and and yeah there was a lot of fiddly bits slowed us down so all the days on the ride around Wales were as long as we'd ever expect a day to be around the world hopefully a lot of them would be a lot shorter but we, we kind of knew that going into it. But for me, the biggest successes were um, the logistics, the kit and everything else that went around outside the riding. So that we did some wild camping, that we used some warm showers hosts that went really well, that we got the provisioning spot on, that, you know, we, we kind of, everything kind of slotted into place. And it's not to say it was easy, but it suddenly felt very doable. Absolutely um so how how do you go about planning something like that i guess you know either the around wales in in eight days uh but then maybe starting there and then in, and then sort of comparing that with how you're planning for the around the world trip and you know, i know a lot of efforts got into that um what have been some of the because what have you been surprised by as part of that yeah you know, what's taken more effort than you thought it would what's been harder what's been easier um yeah I mean yeah trying to describe the around the world planning is just I mean I've I've been at it for over 18 months now and some of the most surprising things are things that you just wouldn't even think about like rejigging your home insurance or you know trying to empty the freezer or um, I'm trying to think of some other like really random things that, that crop up and you know trying to make sure we get all our vaccines on time um yeah there's there's been little logistical things and there's it's just been such a broad you know broad thing to think about that you've ticked every box and that you've you've got everything in place obviously that differed quite a lot from the around wales um as much as a lot of the similar planning did come in it was yeah essentially it was we know Wales, we've ridden around Wales loads and we've got a good awareness of, of lot. We've, we'd ridden lots of the routes before. I kind of nicked the route from, I think it was in the around the Wales bike ride and then I tweaked it. So a lot of the route planning was similar. So the actual um, meat and bones are sitting on a computer looking at routes, looking at if you go this way, what does that do to the elevation and the distance and is that preferable or not? Um, double checking. You're doing that same level of detail for each of the 180 days for your around the world. <laughs> Not entirely, because a lot of the world is flat compared to Wales. So I don't need Very to true. sit and twig, twiddle. And for example, in Australia, you don't have a lot of choice of roads. I think across the Nullarbor, there's one. So yeah. actually, Australia is quite easy to. And yeah, there is a trade off. You can spend hours and hours niggling with it. Um, and around the world, for example, I've um, so coming back through Europe, I've nicked quite a lot of it with permission. Um, I've nicked quite a lot of Ian Walker's route and he holds one of the Europe kind of cross Europe records. Yeah. So I know the route he's chosen. He will have nitpicked to the nth to get the flattest, smoothest, easiest. Yeah, um, okay. So you and, can borrow his nitpicking in that sense. Yeah, yeah. And I've borrowed um, Mark Beaumont's route. I've looked at Tandem Wow's route. So I've borrowed other people's routes, but I have gone through. Um, and then places like India, India I've rooted completely myself, um, but India is relatively flat, so you tend not to make a massive mistake going off a massive mountain without it being quite obvious. Um, 
but I then have gone through pretty much the whole route on satellite and using heat maps as well to make sure that we're not on roads we're not meant to be on. Hopefully somebody cycled down there before is usually a good indication. Um, and then particularly in India and then in Canada as well, actually, I found a few places where there was a bridge that if you look at it on satellite, appears not to be so much of a bridge is is like a, a washed away bridge or there was one just in Canada described as a bridge and it was actually a massive ford and it was um yeah I was just like I don't I don't think we want to be going through that so yeah whereas in Wales we we could just plan it you know we know we're not going to end up anywhere horrendous and if we did end up you know with a somewhere we couldn't get through in Wales you can reroute so easily because there's so many other options um, I should have asked this question first. Um, I thought it might be good just to give a quick run through of the route because I'm not sure you, you've briefly mentioned it in a couple of podcasts, I think. But That's a really good point. Not in any well, real detail recently. So let's let's back up and start. And do you know what? It's from the Brandenburg Yeah, Gate. yeah. It will have changed several times since the beginning of this podcast because I was quite keen to get a route out there sooner rather than later because every, everybody wants to know where you're going. Um, and it may yet change again. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. Um, so yeah let's start at the Brandenburg Gate we are now heading kind of south towards Czechia um, we then go down into Austria got a very small amount of time in Slovakia um, and then into Hungary um, we kind of start following the Danube I figured it's probably going to be pretty flat along there so I thought that was a good call mm -hmm. um, so we follow the Danube through um, Hungary Bulgaria um, then we're into Romania and then we go from Romania to Turkey, um, kind of along the north of Turkey, um, south coast of the Black Sea. And then we go up through Georgia. Um, and then from Georgia, we are meant to be entering Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's land borders are still closed due to COVID. So there may be a, <laughs> there may yet be a change there. Um, if all goes to plan, we'll go through Azerbaijan to get the infamous ferry in Baku, which I believe on this mm -hmm. podcast we've always said, oh, we'll never take that ferry. But actually, the, the other options are very limited, particularly now with the political situation in, in Russia. Um, mm. Yeah, we, we don't have a lot of options. We can't get visas through Iran, for example. We could just skip that bit out entirely, but... Um, that's something you know we don't want to kind of miss the tricky bits as it were we don't want to just kind of zigzag up and down Australia or something like that um so yeah hopefully we'll get across the Caspian Sea one way or the other and then um whatever happens we'll go to Aktau in Kazakhstan and then we go mm -hmm. Kazakhstan into Uzbekistan back into Kazakhstan for a bit and then we will fly from Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan we um, then go to New Delhi in India. We kind of head um, southeast through India until we hit the coastline and then come up north through India to Kolkata. Um, we fly to Bangkok in Thailand, come down through Thailand, um, Malaysia to Singapore, Singapore to Perth. We then ride the south coast of um, Australia, um, and then come up to Brisbane. From Brisbane, we go to Dunedin in New Zealand and then up through both islands, New Zealand to Auckland. Auckland, we fly to Vancouver. Um, we then cross all the way through Canada. Um, so we've stuck to Canada instead of the States for numerous reasons um, to end up in Halifax. Um, and then mm -hmm. from Halifax, we fly to Lis Lisbon in Portugal, Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, boom. Back at the Brandenburg, Brandenburg Gate, Gate. <laughs> hopefully, easy as that. Excellent. Um, where to start? Cause so many questions came up <laughs> when you're running through that, and it's it's not the first time that I've heard that route either. Um, so, uh, why Canada and not uh, not the states? Um, there is a few. It was a, looking a bit trickier with visas and visas and things like that for a start. Yeah. Secondly, there's a lot of elevation going over the Rockies in the States. And Steve wasn't phased by this, but I am pants at elevation. I've, 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 you know, there's this great photo of me at the top of the Glibier in, in the French Alps, which isn't even that high. And I look like death warmed up. So I was quite happy to go through a flatter option through the Rockies. Um, okay. And yep. depending which way you go through the States as well. So if we'd gone like right down the south, like Tandemwau did, that could have been possible. 
it would still be very, very hot that time of year, um, which has its own problems. Mm. If you go further north, um, like Mark Beaumont did on the second time round, there's a lot of prairies. It's very exposed. He had massive problems, the headwinds then. And we still might get some of that in Canada, okay. but maybe not. Another reason is um, we have a very lovely sponsor who, when he found out there was any possibility of us coming through Canada, um, immediately said, you've got to come, you know, if you're coming anywhere near, my door's open, you know. Um, and he's, he's also got a, a um, tap room with 12 craft beers on tap as well. So that could be the end of the record there and then. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> You'll be well invested by that. Point, I know, so. I think it will be grand. Fingers crossed. But he's actually, he's six, 60 miles out of Halifax. So it's not a massive distance, but it then means he is a really good connection to help us get on that flight, get the boxes we need, mm -hmm. get the bike box stuff and everything like that. Um, Help with all those logistics. Yeah, and, and because yeah. he, you know, he's cycling touring life, so he runs his own bike shop as well. If we need anything at that point, he'll be able to help us out. Um, as opposed to we were going to go through New York at one point, and it just felt like a bit of a, I'm sure it'd be a lovely place to visit. I think at that point in the game, I don't think we'll be in the right headspace for, <laughs> for a big in American city. So, yeah. No, it sounds like you, well, you and the bike will probably be in need of an ally at that point. <laughs> yeah, trip. So, uh, Excellent. So uh, I think you kind of touched on this tangentially or you kind of an answer to this question, which was, um, yeah, I know for like records like Land's End, John and Groats, they're sort of a fairly established route now that pretty much everyone uses because that's the most direct, fastest, however you want to look at it. Um, and it sounds like for around the world, well, there's been a, you know, quite a few records now that there isn't sort of an established an established route from the sound of things with you know uh, Mark Beaumont going two different ways on his trips, Tandem Wow going south. You know, so is that is how much variation is there? How much you how much use have you got from previous records and how much have you deviated from uh you know what they've done their routes and, and their experiences? Yeah so <laughs> I won't go through the whole Guinness requirements again because I, I we have definitely touched on those in this podcast. We have well. done that. So, yeah. so there are obviously requirements you've got to stick to but apart from that it's a free-for-all. Um so Mark Beaumont's 80 days route I would pin money on being the fastest route around the planet at that time. I don't think he had any massive political restrictions that stopped him like going a faster way if that makes sense yeah and you know the same jenny then followed his route very successfully too but obviously for example for us if we suddenly decided yeah we want to follow it, that's mo a massive chunk of that is through russia and that would just not be an yeah. option at the moment i'm i'm pretty sure to the point where we were looking at flights and one flight connected through um through russia and it, we just thought that's a no-go so the politics yep. come into play. Um, Tandem Wow obviously had a very successful route as well. Um, and they went from India through um, Myanmar. Um, I think the year after they did it, Myanmar had a massive coup and there's still a lot of political unrest. I think there's been some horrible kidnappings and, and shootings and things recently. So for political reasons, we could not follow their route exactly too. Um, Oh, actually, having said that about Mark Bowman's route, I do know he had to take a different route through the South Island of New Zealand due to landslides at the time. I think it was related to the earthquake there. So, yeah, yeah actually, the quickest route through New Zealand he didn't take. So, yeah, I, I correct myself there. But I think if anybody was to do this again, I, I, I would say every, every person that does this is going to end up with a slightly different route. I don't I don't think unless you went the month after, I think there'll always be politics, yeah. there'll be natural disasters, there'll be something. I suppose when it's a, a, a world scale, that's inevitable. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. certainly some difference. Uh, yeah, and the natural natural yeah. effects and, are a big thing as well. So Tandem and Wow were very badly affected by the drought in Australia, and I think they copped some of the wildfires in Canada as well. So okay. yeah. you know, bigger considerations than politics as well sometimes. And is there any, do, uh, did you or do people ever sort of time it with seasonal winds like you know, El Nino and that kind of thing? Is that, is that a factor in the planning or is that? <laughs> I'll probably live to regret <laughs> Is that just terrible. taking it way too far? No, probably. I'm sure Mark Beaumont did. Um, and I know the direction we're doing it, um, which the vast majority of people do it, is, is to go with the prevailing winds. Having said that, some other people have gone. So Yuliana Bullring, for example, went the other way around. 
and you kind of think well yeah okay you, you then on balance get you know the prevailing winds um and it's, for example I, I think you heard Steve Kirsten be on the um round the Wales trip because we seem to be in a headwind most of the way but I don't think he can he can complain about that because it was a circular route so <laughs> you know it wasn't my fault the yeah. trailing wind switched on the the way well, yeah anyway um <laughs> so I think there is an element of it but how much that actually makes a difference overall yeah I think it gives a bit and you if you're riding day to day I think I think there's much bigger factors I think yeah. yeah okay maybe in Australia and things like that but if you read all these books I think most people run into headwinds in Australia at some point so it's just one of those things yeah absolutely um so I guess the other aspect of the planning side of it is sort of how you've found or how you've managed to put together and work out what equipment to take you know, what apart from the round Wales trip you know, how have you how have you worked out what works what doesn't in terms of fueling logistics clothing camping you know it's doing it in the way you're doing it is self-supported it's a lot more than just maintaining and running a bike for 18,000 miles um you know, how do you how have you worked out how to maintain and run yourselves for that yeah and the the, <laughs> the 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 kind of the um cheap answer is to go a lot of it's experience and a lot of it you know we've done lots of cycling touring holidays with but not not so we've done like expensive cycling touring holidays where we've carried loads of stuff and walking as well we've done walking holidays so it's about like we're carrying the kitchen sink it's been ridiculous um and so you quickly learn a lot from that but as well we've also done so some of the audax rides we do to say anything 600k and above where you've got an overnight stop you quickly learn how little you need to survive overnight Having said that, we've had to bear in mind this is six months. Um, so, you know, that tube of toothpaste, is that going to last you six months or is it not? And OK, you can pick up more tubes of toothpaste. You're not going to carry six months worth of toothpaste with you. But there's little things like that that you have to think about. And yeah, actually, things like um, so soap and, you know, we don't use a lot of um, cosmetics anyway, but the specific soap we tend to use day to day, it might sound daft, but it's almost worth us making sure we've got plenty of that because if you switch something like that around the world, you could adjust your kind of body, um, your, your natural biome that lives on you. So, yeah, there's a degree of consistency you need to have, but you obviously always need to trade that off with weight as well. So, we have got drop points around the world and we'll be utilizing them as much as we can. But apart from that, we're trying to keep everything as minimal as possible, but to the point where probably we would be self-sufficient for a, a few days. So we've kind of we're going to carry like um, a couple of emergency meals. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we, yeah. See recent event. Oh, we can have a chat about that stove again. Um, and <laughs> I was like, no, I thought we decided on the stove. Um, but well, 44 grams or whatever it is. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah well, it's the gas canister as well but yeah so we are trying to go minimal but I think we have to bear in mind as well this is a long trip and as much as yeah we don't want to be taking unnecessary luxuries we do need to consider that th there's bare bones and then there's bare bones if that makes sense as well and you know little things that that could amount up over time to be um, either take us more time trying to find replacements or going to be detrimental yeah fair enough um so what if someone was i don't know getting into the into sort of long distance ultra distance cycling now uh i was trying to sort of benefit from your, your the experience that you've built up over the years uh, what, what sort of top three things should they prioritize in terms of you know equipment and taking care of themselves on the on, on those kind of adventures um so I think a lot of it is, so I would not say to anybody to go out and embark on something like this without, a, you know, doing your groundwork. And I don't mean just riding your bike a long way. I mean, going out for days and riding your bike a long way. So the the overnight skills and the, the skills outside the bike are a massive part of this. So your camp craft, you know, are you happy bivying? Are you happy camping? Are you happy that you don't have pre-booked accommodation for the night? And what are you going to do about that? um yeah. is a big part of it how do you light a stove in a gale <laughs> yeah exactly and if the stove doesn't light yeah. what are you going to do 
Um, yeah. yeah, you can soak a lot of pasta for 12 hours in cold water. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and knowing your response to that as well. So when it, it is miserable, to know that you can get through the other side of that and guess what you know bad stuff happened before and we've coped um the nutrition is is a big part of it too so knowing what works for you and kind of keeping your fueling you know steady and i know a lot of people have will go out with quite set strategies even ultra people sometimes do have you know mark Beaumont is quite an extreme example because what he did was very different to what we're doing but you know he had a very set i must be fed so many you know every so many minutes with you know x amount of calories um whereas we know from experience of longer rides that we eat when we're hungry and how much we need to sustain us and what sort of things we need um and it then means we know how to resupply. So it means that we've then got, you know, we're always getting food in the bank ahead of time. I'm always thinking, right, what are we going to be eating tonight? And then for what we're going to be eating tomorrow morning. So yeah, it's it's all all that that makes the difference. Um, so I think if people did want to get into the longer distances, I think that's great. A club like Audax is, is great for that. Um, and building up the mileage and the endurance is is massive. But if you want to go on to the long distance events, I think you need to build the skills around that as well. And you need to be taking yourself out in a bivy or you need to be, you know, learning how to how, where you're going to resupply yourself and how you're going to plan that and how, how you're going to know if the next village has got a shop or not. And it's all those little things that can amount up to make success. Absolutely. So last couple of things. Um... I think you're going to have a, a dot that we can all watch while you're doing this. Um, like where, where and when will people be able to find that? What, how else are people going to be able to sort of follow the adventure while you're, while you're going around the world? Yeah, so the, um, the, the dot tracker, um, very kindly provided by um, Follow My Challenge, is we're, we're get, going to get that embedded on our website. So the website, um, which I must admit you have been instrumental in, is www.stellatandem.com. Um, and there will be a page on there that will link you directly to the tracker, and there'll be a little dot that will drop down and show you exactly where we are in the world. So we're just finalising that at the moment. So yeah, you will very much be able to dot watch us. Um, <laughs> aside from that and internet um, connection dependent, um, yeah, I've, I've obviously been very active on social media. So um, Instagram and Facebook are probably my preferred mediums. Um, so I'm hoping to continue to update them regularly. Um, and yeah, we do have um, Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Um, so hopefully be able to feed into them as well. I have ambitions of being able to continue the blog, maybe on a weekly basis. Um, I'm a bit reluctant to commit myself too much dependent on how things go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm hopeful to keep updates going, going around the world. So I'm hoping people will, yeah, follow us along the way. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Um, cool. So I want to uh, wrap up with uh, your usual set of tandem trivia um but i think we'll skip the first question because we know the answer to that of whether you've ridden a tandem before uh and go straight to um who would you have uh on a tandem um living dead sports person or otherwise um and would you have them as stoker or captain um but for you you can't have stevie uh, yeah, so I thought you thought you might be asking this. <laughs> it wouldn't be stoked to be here otherwise, would it? Um, yeah, and I've got a couple of really cheesy answers, I'm afraid. So in true stoked to be here, here style, because I was looking back at um, some of uh, the, the previous guest answers. Yeah, I've not chosen just one person. Um, and yeah, looking back, because I was thinking, I was like, oh, who do I choose? And I was kind of it, immediately I started thinking about um, all the guests that I've had on the podcast, you know, and <laughs> I, I, and I look back at the list and I'm absolutely astounded that I've spoken to all these people. I mean, you know, the fact that I've got Mark Beaumont, Jenny Graham, Tandem Well, all around the world record holders and all three of the Europe record holders have been on my podcast. Um, Richard Sodde on his penny farthing. Um, yeah, Emily Chappell, oh, Katie Cooker, every, 
everybody that has been on this podcast has been amazing and, get, and I would say I would very happily go for a tandem ride with any of those um, just to have more chats with them because they've all been fantastic and um, and then I kind of went and looked at my kind of wish guest list as well. So the people I haven't had on that I've kind of niggled at and maybe timings haven't suited or they've been, you know, things just haven't panned out. And there's people like um, Fiona Kolbinger, um, Jasmine Muller, um, Luke Grenfell Shaw, who's done an amazing charity bike ride um, called Bristol to Beijing on a tandem, but he's been too really busy riding his bike um and yeah um Yulia, Yuliana Bullring is is another one as well um all these people if and I say if big if if I was ever to do another season of Stokes to be here there's still loads of people I'd love to chat to and so again yeah you know Stoke to be here has been my my tandem seat for all these people so yeah that's nice. the first part of my answer <laughs> My second answer to it is potentially even cheesier. Um, it would be myself as like a, I'd say young to mid teenager to go, do you know what? You know, you're not sporty. You think you're rubbish at sport. You can't run for love nor money. I've now run from one side of the country to the other. Um, you can just about ride a bike, but you'll never amount to anything sporty. And at that age as well, I wasn't very confident. I didn't like talking to people. Asked me to stand up in front of my class and talk. I had an absolute meltdown to, you know, sit her on the back and kind of go, do you know what? Things are going to change and you just need to have a bit more confidence and stick with it. And yeah, you know, I, th I think, you know, my 12, 13 year old self would be absolutely mind blown. So that's my second cheesy part of the, the answer. And then <laughs> I've had more time to think about it than most of my guests because I do spring <laughs> it on them, I must admit. Um, <laughs> um, and then the front of the back's really hard because um, we literally went on a bike ride last night um, on, on solar bikes and I was spinning along the reins. I thought, oh, I'm not going to ride my own bike for six months. And I was actually genuinely quite upset about that. And I love being stoker and yeah, you know, it is a different perspective. It's, it is very different from riding your own bike and it's got a lot of pros and cons. Um, and yeah, I've, you know, I've never been captain on tandem, so I'm not sure I'm in the possess best position to ask that. But yeah, if I was told I had to either ride, you know, stoker on a tandem all, all my life or ride my own bike. Yeah, I hate to say it. I think I'd choose my own bike because... Yeah, I, I, I would genuinely miss that feeling of freedom of being able to go where you want, pick up your bike and just ride. Yeah. Fair enough, like it. Uh, so the next tandem trivia question. Um, uh, you always say that you and Stevie are joined by the frame uh, rather cheesily, as you said. So um, <laughs> I, know, I always grate my teeth. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, what a well. When you're not joined to Stevie by the frame, what are you? What are you joined by the frame to? What What can you not be without on a ride? Um, yeah, I know Stevie's answer and pretty much everybody's answer will probably be my phone, which I am always glued to. But ugh, there's such amazing pieces of technology now, and from things like routing to finding out where the nearest cafe is, finding out where the nearest bike shop that can rebuild a tandem wheel is. That's happened. Um, you know, little things like Google Translate or, yeah, yeah. there's there's so, so much capability. And when you look at Mark Beaumont's, particularly like Mark Beaumont's first ride, where he was still having to go to embassies to get visas and, you know, he was having to send, I don't think he's quite in the realms of sending telegrams, but everything, you know, is so much harder um, and all these paper trails, whereas now you get an e-visa on your phone. <laughs> it's, yeah it's a different world so it's a massive tool but yeah I am completely addicted to my phone particularly through this and the social media and everything so to go for a less you know less electronic um thing I would I would probably say you know something that comes with in pretty much every ride is my buffs <laughs> or other neck warmer slash neck tube slash name of your choosing um which i have several of but they're just fantastic you can just use them for everything um so you know neck warmer i make little bandanas head scarves yeah. um Wouldn't be without masks. mine outdoors yeah yeah you can clean your glasses i've used them as towels you can make the dog wear them yeah, yeah. so yeah i love a buff <laughs> excellent 
Um, good stuff. So final question needs to be slightly different, I guess, to normal. Um, so instead of why should you, well, yeah, why are you looking to ride around the world and break the, break the world record? <laughs> What's the motivation? Question. Yeah, um, I think a big part of it is even if you hate cycling, you hate bikes, you've never ridden a bike, you hate exercise, you know, if you ignore the physicality of it, imagine if you could see the world at the speed of a bicycle. Because at the speed of the bicycle, you take in so much weight, and it's different from being in a car. You know, you experience the elements, the sounds, the smells. Um, so, you know, even for anybody that, that does not ever want to put their foot on a pedal, just imagine being able to travel magically at that speed and see the whole, you know, the whole way around the world. I think that's a big part of it. Um, but admittedly, a major part of it is the challenge. And yeah, I think, you know, Steve might kind of <laughs> not deny it as such, but he, he will often go, it's all your idea. But I think we are both lured to a challenge and this is the biggest challenge yet. And I think it is, it is a bit about proving ourselves and yeah, you know, we want to go at this speed. We, we want to, yeah, show people what we can do and we want to hold a world record and that would just be absolutely amazing. So yeah <laughs> well I'm, I'm i'm sure you're going to um i can't wait to can't wait to see you set off and uh yeah and smash it uh, put in put in all the hard work uh, so, yeah really looking yeah, forward to right. seeing it and, and all the best well thank you so much and thank you so much for being our interviewer for these these past two episodes i've not listened to steve's yet so i hope he, he's said nice things about me but <laughs> no it's yeah, been a pleasure and you never know, stoked to be him might be back in the future. We shall see. <laughs> well, on that note, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. No, thank you.